research interest in vitamin D, among other things, and fracture healing. I don't know if we'll be hearing some of that today. Uh, you have to come to the AAP meeting on Sunday in New Orleans, where I'll be speaking about that. There you go. There you go. That'll be the next door prize. It'll be a trip to New Orleans uh, to hear about vitamin D. So anyway, welcome, Bettina, and we're interested in hearing about fractures today. And if, I don't know if you want the... No, I think, I think I will stand right here. I don't plan on moving around a whole lot. Um, I will... Um, add that there may be one or two kind of gross pictures in my talk, and since it is after lunch, I just felt like I should warn everyone. Um, I want to thank um, thank you guys for coming today, and thank Dr. Petty for asking me to speak to y'all. Uh, if I knew how, I would. Um, I've never been accused of being quiet. Um, Let's see program, program volume. volume. Your far end volume. Who's at the far end? I don't know. Well, wherever they are, it's We're all louder. maxed. How's that? Is that any better? Perfect. All right. I have nothing to disclose. Um, the reason, so we're here today. A couple of points I will discuss is that children are not small adults. I think that's been a theme other people have raised. And what makes some parts of pediatric fracture care different than what we do for adults. Um, sort of the overall theme today has been injury prevention. So I'm gonna talk about some high risk activities that kids do often involving things that people consider to be toys. Um, and then finally a few things about pre-hospital fracture care for our sort of pre-hospital EMT people that are I know in the audience today. Um, so when you ex examine an injured child, I actually often will begin with the uninjured part of the child. Pick an uninjured leg, an uninjured arm, just to kind of gain their trust. And parents will say, it's the other leg. Yeah, I know. I get it. <laughs> it's a method to my madness. Um, so you can palpate them, see if anything looks obviously abnormal or deformed, carefully assess and document what the neurologic status is, the neurovascular status, because um, this can change over time. So it's something you need to make sure you know what it was when they came in and then each, each subsequent time that you see the patient. And then we get some x-rays um, of the injured part. Usually you want those two x-rays in two <coughs> orthogonal planes. This is, not off, this is often difficult in kids. They're in pain, they don't want to cooperate. It's hard to position the limb to get good x-rays. Um, so we ask you to do the best you can. Um, include the joint above the fracture and the joint below the fracture. Um, and understand what normal ossification patterns are. Oftentimes, x-rays look very different depending on the age of the child. Things that look like um, fractures are often normal growth plates in young kids and things that look like there's nothing there, like there's emptiness, is really cartilage that you can see. I'm sorry, do I need to wear that so they can yeah. hear next door? Okay, perfect. Um, getting Comparison x-rays is rarely needed, um, but it can help you if you're just not quite sure what you're looking at and what's normal and what's abnormal. Right now I'm holding too many things. Is this clip on? Maybe, all right, my papers and everything. All right, um, so the fracture treatment principles in children sort of in general is that kids will heal faster than adults. Um, they often have different mechanisms of injury. They have different patterns of fracture. The initial amount of displacement can be very different depending on the age of the child and how the fracture pattern happens. Um, and whether it's an open or closed injuries and all these can affect how rapidly things heal and how you treat the child. They usually don't need to be casted or splinted for near as long as adults because, once again, they heal a lot faster whenever I've, patients will come to me and say, oh, you know, we were told he's going to be in a cast for three months, and that's telltale sign you've been to the grown-up doctor. <laughs> um, they're much less likely to have stiffness after long-term casting. So usually you have to cast them long enough to get them really solidly healed because kids are crazy. They're all on top of the monkey bars, like on this picture here, swinging upside down, and they're sort of all or nothing. Um, basic treatment principles continue, so you just want to basically restore the normal 
length of the extremity and normal alignment of the extremity and the normal torsion of the extremity. You should try to minimize the, the um, amount of residual angulation um, using closed um, casting means, and that involves cast changes, wedging casts, making sure your casts are properly applied. Um, and this is a little bit of a lost art of casting. I think so prevalent these days in hospitals are cast techs, which are wonderful, but you still, at the end of the day, have to learn how to uh, properly apply a cast and hold the fracture in the proper position so that it can heal. And remember that if the fracture is displaced, and especially if it's intraarticular, um, those have to be reduced anatomically. Intraarticular fractures don't sort of change their position once they are healed. Um, in order to achieve this, um, you need adequate anesthesia or analgesia. The patient needs to be adequately relaxed. This can be done with regional anesthesia, local anesthesia, such as um, blocks or even hematoma blocks. Um, or conscious sedation or sometimes general anesthesia. And you just have to kind of use your clinical judgment based on age of the child, the nature of the injury, and how much um, manipulation you may need to do in terms of which one of these you're going to choose. And one actually thing is the more acutely the fracture is reduced, the easier it is actually to reduce. The longer you wait, the longer you get all that swelling of the remedy, it gets much, much harder to reduce. But so the vast, vast number of pediatric fractures can be treated um, non-operatively. Some important exceptions are obviously open fractures, which we'll ta talk about here in a minute. Um, Salter two or three, so the Salter-Harris classification refers to fractures at or through a physis. Basically, the twos and threes are intraarticular fractures that are displaced and then um, also in polytrauma, we're usually much more aggressive about fixing fractures because it lets kids get out of the hospital quicker potentially and get back to activities quicker. Um, attempt to restore the alignment we've already talked about. Reduce physial injuries gently. The more you manipulate them, the more you risk injuring them. And it's actually okay to leave physial injuries a little bit displaced because you have really massive re, re, mm, 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 re mm, hodling potential at the physis. Applying well mode of the cast and splints um, using the M use the max, use the best type of immobilization that you can on the day of injury. I always try to remember a very important thing. I was taught um, in my training and pass this on to the people that I'm training is pretend that patient's never going to come back when they're supposed to and give them the absolute best treatment that you can on the day you encounter them. If you put them in a splint saying, oh, well, you know, it's not the best splint and it's kind of loose and it's kind of disheveled and, oh, but we'll fix that when they come back to the office at the end of the week. If they never come back, that's a big problem. So give them the absolute best maximum amount of safe treatment that you can at the time of injury. But also remember that these are gonna potentially swell and you have to think about that when you're putting casts on. Um, and consider either splitting the cast, or if you really are concerned about swelling, putting on a well-placed splint, which you are then gonna change out to a cast once the swelling is reduced. Um, if you're watching a fracture that you've reduced, I usually recommend x-raying weekly for a week or two to make sure that the fracture doesn't sh shift out of place. And these fractures will, sh shift out of place and it's not the patient did anything wrong or the parent did anything wrong or the cast was incorrectly applied it just happens so here's an example of a displaced fracture of the distal radius um, that was nicely reduced and has a well molded well placed cast the cast is not super thick there's not a ton of padding one or two layers of padding followed by one or two layers of fiberglass is all you need. You not need a Herman Munster cast to hold a fracture line. It's actually bad to put on a Herman Munster cast. That's how your fractures get shifted out of place. 
Um, fiberglass cast, once again, um, if you're concerned about swelling, um, split them appropriately. You'll notice that this cast is split sort of anterior posterior. So if you've had a fracture that you're concerned about shifting in the opposite plane, if you're worried about the fracture shifting on the medial side or the lateral side, as in this particular picture, <laughs> make your split 90 degrees opposite the direction you're concerned about. Um, and then elevate them, admit them to the hospital, monitor for swelling. But once again, this is a very adequate way to treat the majority of pediatric <coughs> fractures. Loss of reduction, like I said, does happen. It happens commonly. It happens as the swelling decreases. Nobody did anything wrong. And I'll warn parents in the ER that the fracture will potentially shift a little bit. You can accept a little bit of angulation in most young kids. It's not going to be a problem. I generally do recommend not re-manipulating injuries of the physis more than about a week after injury because, once again, you just risk further injury to the physis, and these will re-model re very easily and very predictably. Usually fractures in the diaphysis or the metaphysis of the bone can be re-manipulated with appropriate anesthesia up to three weeks after injury, depending on the age of the child. I personally, if I have to re-manipulate something more than about a week to a week and a half after injury, I take them to the operating room because they really need to be adequately anesthetized with muscle relaxation. Injuries to the physis, like I talked about already, heal rapidly. They usually heal in about half the time it takes for a fracture in the, in the shaft to heal. Um, and healing time is dependent on multiple factors, the, where the fracture is, how displaced it was at the initial injury, and obviously also the age of the child. And um, like I already said earlier, err towards the side of casting for longer if there's any question about the adequacy of the healing that you're seeing on your x-ray. So now some couple of things about surgery. Sometimes we do um, have to open, reduce fractures. Um, when we do this, you have to remember to respect and protect the physial cartilage. It's actually really important to protect the periosteum surrounding the physis, that's where most of the injury to the physis happen. If somebody gets in there and uh, aggressively rips off the periosteum, don't be afraid to make an adequate incision. You don't do anybody any favors by making some cutesy little in incision that doesn't allow you to adequately visualize the fracture and adequately visualize that your reduction is adequate. Um, if you need to use internal fixation, try to keep it in the metaphysis or the epiphysis, um, especially in kids that are young. And if you have to cross the physis with an implant, try to make it a smooth implant. However, that being said, sometimes we have to put screws or other non-smooth implants across the physis. And that's OK to do as long as you know what the consequences of that are and that you have options for fixing the consequences. And if I do end up having to put a screw across a physis in a young child, then I usually re remove it relatively early um, after the fracture is healed. Um, here's a, a good example of a Salter Harris IV of the distal tibia. You see there's an intraarticular split with an intraarticular step off. Um, this was open, reduced, pinned with these two smooth pins. Oftentimes I will now use a screw across the epiphysis instead. And um, what we did is we put two little pins on either side of the physis and then you see on the um, subsequent follow-up x-ray that the distance between the those two little pins has increased so you know that physis is growing and um, I see a lot of kids referred in because I also if you'll notice on the way that physis looks on the ankle on the right it looks very undulating and that happens after trauma and I don't really know what that means but I get a lot of kids sent in having been taken care of elsewhere thinking that that little bit of, uh, of uh, undulation of the distal tibial physis is a physial arrest. But here you have that undulation, and you have proof that the physis is actually OK and continuing to grow. 
fracture complications in children do happen. Um, they are sometimes different than the fracture complications you see in adults. Um, malunions, especially in young kids, often will re, re model as they grow, and it makes the ex extremity potentially look ugly and it takes a lot of talking to the parents and more importantly the grandparents that it's going to be fine. Give it two years, give it three years, it is going to be fine. The arm works normally, it doesn't hurt, looks ugly for a while, but usually it ends up being okay. Um, getting a limb length discrepancy is often a result of a physial injury or sometimes due to shortening at the fracture site. You can actually also get a limb length discrepancy due to the egg super amount of healing response that kids have that the injured limb actually ends up longer. This is a particular problem um, in femur fractures in kids under 10. You actually want them to be a little bit overlapped because they're at high risk of ending up longer than the other leg. It's usually, once again, not a problem, not enough to where it's clinically significant, and usually will sort of auto-equilibrate over the years. Um, Non-unions are rare in kids. Cross-unions, that's an example of this picture here, where the, which would happen in the lower leg where the tibia and fibula end up connected, once again, just because of the exuberant healing response that kids have. This can also happen in the forearm, um, and this does have to be surgically unconnected when it happens. Um, and then you get osteonecrosis, um, which most, most commonly happens in either the um, proximal femur, i.e. the hip from a f fracture th through the proximal femur, or in the talus from a fracture in the talus. Soft tissue injuries are actually a higher risk of complications in pediatric fractures than all those other things I mentioned. Vascular injuries are a problem, especially with fractures near and or about the elbow or the knee. Um, neurologic injuries are usually you do from nerve stretch and usually resolve. Um, compartment syndromes do happen in kids and actually can be very hard to sometimes know in a kid what's going on because guess what they're screaming because they're scared and they're in pain and it's sometimes very hard and so I know we at, a, at our institution have a fairly low threshold for releasing compartments if they're at all acting like they're in pain that we can't con control because a compartment syndrome is a disaster. Um, cast sores and pressure ulcers are a big problem especially in young kids and you have to remember that applying cast and splints are not necessarily benign. The biggest problem is applying a cast or splint sort of prophylactically, prophylactically for something that might be fractured, might be in pain, and then it turns out they doesn't have a fracture, but oops, suddenly they have a cast problem or a pressure sore, or pressure ulcer. So just something to be aware of. If somebody is in a cast and they're complaining of pain, I take their cast off and look. Um, and then casts get hot as they get hard. I don't know how many of you guys actually have the occasion to take of, of putting casts on. The casts get hot. This actually the picture here is a girl who had a cast put on for a toddler's fracture and got this this cast burn across the anterior aspect of her ankle. Also use care when removing cast because the blade of the cast saw gets hot. You can't cut the child with a cast saw. We all hold it up to our hand and see, look, it makes loud noise, but it won't cut you. That cast saw gets hot and it'll burn you. So change your saw blade, don't get your saw blade dull. I just changed it in the OR yesterday. No, I don't, I don't. But I'm very careful, and especially like if I'm taking off like a long, a, a big cast, like a pica cast, I cut a little piece of it about this much, and then I make all the residents touch the saw blade. It is burning hot, and then you let it cool off, and then you cut a little more, and you let it cool off, and you let it cool off. You will burn the kid. This is my gross picture. Sorry, I'm saying I'm all the talking. The gross picture's up. Um, open fractures do happen in kids. Remember, IV antibiotics, tetanus, um, prophylaxis. These need to be emergently, urgently IND. The skeletal fractures need to be stabilized initially. That can often be done with a temporary X fix. We rarely treat fractures anymore long-term in X-Fix and kids. I remember when I was in residency in the late 90s, femur fractures in kids, for example, were routinely treated with X-Fixes from the beginning to the end. We don't do that anymore. 
Um, so X fixes are usually t temporary in kids, and sometimes you need soft tissue coverage depending on the nature of the injury. Some location-specific fracture patterns. Um, Non-union, I'm sorry, a malunion of a supracondylar humerus fracture will cause a cubitus varus deformity. Once again, it's completely not a functional problem, but the elbow looks ugly. Um, a Volkmann's ischemic is, is contracture is basically a missed compartment syndrome of the forearm, also after supracondylar humerus fracture. You do get refractures after, uh, most commonly after forearm fractures. They're exceedingly rare these days in femur fractures after we stopped treating femur fractures in X fixes. This is something we discovered that if you treat femur fractures in X fixes, the refracture rate is almost 50%. Um, I already talked a little bit about over growth after femur fractures due to the massive healing response that kids have non-union of lateral condyle fractures of the elbow because they are intra-articular, so these almost always need to be fixed, otherwise they go on to non-union. Um, I already mentioned a little bit about osteonecrosis of either the femoral neck or the talus, I'm sorry, either the femoral head or the talus after fractures of the femoral neck or the talus, and you can get progressive valgus after proximal tibia fractures also for reasons that we don't really understand. We once again think it has to do with just the exuberant healing response that kids have. Children's fracture, once again, you can accept lots of angulation in young kids. The closer you are to the um, physis, the faster the re hobbling happens. This is a good example here of a fracture that basically healed. You can kind of make out, let me see if I can draw with my arrow. So this fracture used to go here and there and there, right? So all this is the healing response that you get that over time just sort of straightens out as the kid will grow. Um, this is re remodeling potential is higher the younger you are. It happens very predictably in kids under 10 and is greatest at fractures um, near a physis. The remodeling is not as re reliable for mid-shaft angulation, older kids, large angulations, and if there's any sort of torsional or interarticular deformity. I already kind of mm -hmm. talked about this. I'm going to speed through because I'm running out of time. So back to, here to the injury part. So childhood, I'm s any of us surviving childhood is amazing, I think, because all the crazy stuff <laughs> kids do. Um, just in the current <laughs> Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics, there's a report by the Trauma and Prevention Committee of the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America, focusing on four main areas of preventable injuries in childhood, and I'll go into all of these a little bit here now. The trampolines, skateboards, ATVs, and lawnmowers. Interestingly, just last week, um, actually, Two weeks ago in the New York Times Magazine, which is in addition to the Sunday New York Times, um, they have this little section called, Who Invented This? And it was on trampolines on September the 28th. So who knew that trampolines were invented by a teenager in Iowa in the 1930s so he could join the Iowa Hawkeye Circus? He um, formed a company then that manufactured these trampolines and then came the lawsuits, and in the 70s, there were many children maimed or paralyzed on his trampolines. And the corporation went out of business in 1989 because they were no longer able to insure against all the lawsuits they were getting. So who knows who is making trampolines these days? They're probably made in China or who knows where, um, but they are no longer manufactured in the United States by the Nissan Corporation. Um, there are, are 100,000 injured children from trampolines in the year 2009, which is the most recent statistics I can find. This happens obviously more common in summer, usually in early school age kids. This usually happens when there's more than one child on the trampoline. And most injuries um, happen without the child falling off the trampoline. So the safety net is just a misnomer. Um, and injury patterns can really be anything at all. Um, interestingly, I recently discovered, I don't have kids, but there's a trampoline gym in Winston-Salem, which has been great for my business. Um, and I've started asking parents what kind of waiver they have to sign when they bring their kids there, because I can't imagine any lawyer would allow that place to stay open, but somehow they are open. Um, I don't know how that happens. So ER visits are common from trampoline injuries. Um, this involves fractures about 30% of the time, and 14% of injuries from trampolines require a trip to the operating room. The Academy of Orthopedic Surgery um, has this position statement that says that 
They should not be used for unsupervised recreational activities. and does not recommend it to be used in children under age six. And I've gotten calls over the years from other doctors, other providers saying, oh, it was just a trampoline. Is there something wrong with the child? Do they need a DEXA scan for their bone density? And if you look up on the internet what the kinetic energy of a trampoline bat is, it's basically equivalent to being ejected from a moving vehicle at 50 miles an hour. Because what you have to remember is the kinetic energy is, uh, is highest right prior to landing, right? So your kinetic energy goes, when you jump up, it's zero at the top and is highest right when you land. And the formula for kinetic energy is like half your mass times the velocity squared, and it's that exponential increase in the velocity that when you have two very different size people on there, i.e. adults or young kids and older kids, that the kinetic energy from the larger object gets transferred to the smaller object because usually the larger object is up and the kinetic energy of it is zero and the smaller object that's down absorbs all the kinetic energy of the larger object. That's how kids get hurt. Physics, yes. Yes. And you notice or you don't get hurt falling off the you don't, you don't get hurt falling off. It's the kinetic energy of the mat that hurts you and that's unfortunately no different whether you're on the ground or in the ground or above the ground. It's the kinetic energy of the mat. It's not the ground. I mean, there are some kids who get hurt falling off and I'll show some examples of that, but um, it's really not the answer to the problem. Um, in 1999, the American Academy of Pediatrics came up with a similar position statement to the um, AAOS that said that trampoline injuries are dramatically increasing and result in considerable childhood injuries. Most of them occur on privately owned trampolines and there are few, if any, of the safety recommendations that are ever followed. And that they, at 1999, supported rec a recommendation that these should not be used for recreational use in school or potentially even competitively if not used in a supervised environment. Well, nobody paid that much attention, so they revised their statement in September 2012. Despite previous recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatrics discouraging the home use of trampolines, the recreational use of trampolines in the home setting continues to be popular activity. Current implementation of safety measures have not appeared to change the risk substantially, and therefore the use of home trampolines is strongly discouraged. But if you Google trampoline safety, this is what you get. You get ads from Walmart, Target, Toys R Us. It's really fascinating. T type those words into any search engine and you get ads to buy trampolines, not trampoline safety issues. Because I think they have more influence on consumer purchases than the American Academy of Pediatrics or the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery. So a couple of examples. Here's a kid who actually did fall off the trampoline. Two plus 10 year old was out there with all the other kids. And the family was great. They had bought a net. Their trampoline was going to be so safe. But he can unzip the net. He fell off and had this actually really horrible supracondylar humerus fracture that required surgery and three pins. Um, this was another five plus eight year old jumping with a bunch of other kids, all different sizes and ages. He had a bad supracondylar humerus fracture and a pulseless hand. This is a surgical emergency. You can lose an arm from this. You know, all from a toy. It's not a toy. Um, this is a good one. A three-year-old was jumping on the trampoline with his dad. Once again, remember, he is absorbing the kinetic energy of the father. This is a femur fracture. This is high energy trauma. This is what you see in kids ejected from moving vehicles and all sorts of things. So it's a trampoline. It's not a toy. Um, moon bouncers. Actually, one of my partners woke up one Saturday morning to this across the street from his house. So he took... <laughs> So he, text, so he texts me this picture and says, want to come over with a bunch of K-wires and a cordless drill and just set up shop because this is what we're going to be doing. <laughs> These are, once again, same injury pattern as from trampolines. Most common injuries, elbow fractures, and you get hurt either colliding with other kids or here you actually do get hurt falling out because once again, they have these nets around them and kids unzip them and slide out. Um, Next, moving on to the other injury things that people use, the skateboards. One of the, once again, these are high energy injuries. These things can go 50 miles an hour. Who knew? Um, they account for approximately 93,000 injuries a year. Most of them are in males. The peak age is between 10 and 14. And most injuries are to the wrist, forearm, ankle, and elbow.
Um, once again, there are AAOS and AAP guidelines about the safety and use of these things that nobody is aware of or pays attention to. Recommending age appropriate participation, use of protective equipment, adult supervision, um, consumer education and training. They should not be used by children under five at all, and children six to ten should be closely supervised and they should not be used in traffic. Um, I have a great story. I was telling somebody at lunch that I was driving home from work one day and I was almost home and I'm driving down this sort of major road in my neighborhood and off on the sidewalk. Now, granted, it was the sidewalk, but still in home end of work day traffic was a girl in flip-flops on a skateboard with a pink cast on her arm. <laughs> Excuse me? And they, so I walked, I sort of slowed down. I'm like, it's not my patient. So I called up my partner who lives in my neighborhood. I'm like, John, is that your patient with the pink cast and the flip-flops on the skateboard? He says, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, kids do crazy stuff. A um, couple of examples. This is a femur fracture. This is a bad femur fracture. These are high inert injuries. This is a 12-year-old boy who just got a new skateboard at the garage sale. I remember being in pre-op holding with him, sort of saying, maybe you bought it from the kid who broke his leg last week and sold it at the garage sale. <laughs> who knows? 11-year-old um, boy with intraarticular ankle fractures, similar to ones I showed earlier. He was out on the street skateboarding. Um, so a lateral condyle elbow fracture, six-year-old, all these kids don't meet anything near the recommended AAP guidelines of six to ten-year-olds need to be directly supervised and not in the street. Um, these toys can actually lead to serious polytrauma. This is a patient actually that Dr. Petty and I are familiar with. Nine-year-old girl was riding a <coughs> sc scooter in her neighborhood, got hit by an SUV. She has a mid-shaft femur fracture, a mid-shaft humerus fracture, and a segmental tibia fracture, and also had a spleen injury and ended up with a splenectomy from a toy. ATVs are very popular in this part of the country, I discovered when I moved here a few years ago. Um, the Consumer Protection and Safety Committee, as well as the ATV injury, in ATV industry actually got together and signed a consent decree in 1988, which was allowed to expire in 2005. And what this did in 1988, it said that no child under 16 can use an ATV. It promoted safety training modules and it discontinued the production of a three-wheel ATV. And in these six years after this decree has been allowed to expire, ATV accidents increased 101% in the United States. Um, there are currently no federal laws or any kind of legislation except ex that regulates the use of ATVs or their safety. Um, there's been a 90% increase in hospitalization due to ATV accidents from 2004 to, two, sorry, between 2000 and 2004, and that was right after that ATV industry and consumer product safety decree was signed. Um, in 2004, the, they passed a law in West Virginia mandating helmet use, requiring rider training for kids under 18, limiting distance use to 10 miles and speed less than 25. And in the following two years after this law was passed, ATV fatalities among 10 to 17 year olds increased. So these laws just don't do anything. Nobody pays attention. ATV use here is very common. There's an article in the North Carolina Medical Journal in 2009 that the North Car Carolina legislature actually passed ATV-specific safety legislation that pr prohibits their use by children under eight, requiring use of a helmet and prohibiting more than one person on the ATV at a time. Um, this did lead to a decrease in injuries in children under eight, but however, overall, the riding patterns, the helmet use, alcohol use, and the morbidity and mortality from ATVs did not change. This is actually a very sad article from several years ago. I'm not quite sure I know where Columbus County, North Carolina is. So we're just recounting this three-year-old boy who was one of four children riding on an ATV, all under the age of nine, and none of them were wearing helmets. And they interviewed his mother, who said, I was against this, but my husband said, oh, ATVs are fine, I was raised around them, they're not a problem, it's a way of life, it's what everybody does, all the neighbors are doing it. And this mom's like, I was terrified, so I went in the house and I just didn't even want to look. So um, she you know, basically says, you know, she had this gut 
feeling that this was dangerous and bad and she didn't stand up for herself and you have to stand up for yourself. Those of y'all who sort of interact with me and work with me know that I'm fairly adamant about ATV safety and like all these kids, I call the social worker for every one of these kids because I think this needs to be reported to Child Protective, Safe, Child Protective Services and to the county sheriff where these accidents happen because until it's your child that gets injured or your neighbor's child, it's just numbers and statistics. Yes. No. But I still keep calling. <laughs> Might make me feel better, but unfortunately they are not interested. Um, again, AOS and AP guidelines um, rec advise against ATV use by children under 16. And however, though, despite efforts by consumer groups, legislature, and multiple professional organizations, there's not been appreciable risk in reducing ATV related accidents, injuries, and deaths. Um, head injuries are the leading cause of death, representing 22 to 45 percent of all ATV injuries, and orthopedic injuries account for 60 percent of all ATV injuries. A few examples, this is a six-year-old, cute little blonde-headed girl, was at grandpa's house, riding an ATV, no helmet, rolled over, femur fracture, so she is six. So in the state of North Carolina, under age eight, this is against the law. Nobody cares. Nobody got fined, nobody went to jail, nobody cares. Here's an eight-year-old with this horrible T condylar split elbow fracture. This is high energy injury, adult fracture pattern, roll over ATV, the ATV landed on top of her. Um, bad injuries. Lawnmowers, my second set of gross pictures. Um, this is probably the most common cause of open fractures in kids. Most children are injured as a rider or just running around the lawn, 70%. And actually, um, the other, in case anybody is wondering how you can be injured by a lawnmower if you're not a rider or, or a bystander, it's if you're the operator, um, which accounts for the injuries in older kids. These have very, very high complication rates. These lead to terrible outcome. Less than 50% have any sort of satisfactory outcome after a lawnmower injury. There's been no change seen in lawnmower injury pattern over a 40-year time period despite multiple public service campaigns. And like I already said, the three groups of injured children are the operators, the bystanders, and the passengers. And um, Dr. Pranikoff and I are saying all the time that we see kids all the time, like riding on grandpa's lap on the riding lawnmower, super dangerous. And um, you know, and you have to remember when you talk to these families that the, num the treatment decisions that you have to talk to parents about, the decisions that the parents are able to make in terms of surgical options and treatment options are all driven by this horrible thing that they basically just perpetrated on their child. And they can't think straight, so you have to really sort of counsel these families as a whole, not just take care of the injured child. Um, rotary mower blades are extremely powerful. They can generate 2,100 foot-pounds of force and hurl a projectile 200 miles per hour into a bystander, um, and the two age related peaks, once again, kids under five, those are the bystanders, the passenger, and then the adolescents that are the operators. Um, these are usually open fractures that are grossly contaminated, usually require multiple INDs, multiple trips to the operating room. They grow all sorts of stuff that grows in the dirt. Um, this is a four-year-old who some of y'all may have been involved with, ran out the car, he and mom had been shopping. He gets excited, comes home, is like, Daddy, Daddy, he's out on the lawnmower, and the kid slips on the wet grass and gets his arm under the lawnmower. Um, so if anybody has any great ideas on how to put in a new elbow in a four-year-old, I'm open to suggestions, because nobody has answers to this. Um, he ended up getting a f flap, his X-Fix is now off, but he's got this sort of flail elbow that doesn't hurt. And the amazing thing about this is he has completely intact neurovascular function distally. So I don't know how you amputate through your entire elbow joint and not hit a nerve or a vessel, but somehow you did. Um, here's a three-year-old who was riding on the lawnmower with grandpa. Um, I kind of like this top picture. It's like perfect little anatomy of all the foot bones. They're just not in the right order anymore. Um, and the, um, he ended up with a sign amputation when the mower ran over his right leg. Um, so education and prevention are the keys to this. Children under 14 should not be operating a lawnmower and they should not even be in the yard when the lawnmower is operated by somebody else. And nobody other than the mower operator should be on the riding lawnmower. So a couple of things and I'll wrap up here. I think I have some time. Um, the pre-hospital fracture care. So if you get called to a child or if a child is injured, if you're at the scene of a child injury, whatever extremity is injured, in 
mobilize them in whatever you have available. That can be a box, that can be a stick, that can be a magazine, it can be a telephone book, an attempt to splint the joint above and the joint below what's injured. This kid was actually perfectly comfortable with his femur fracture in the box. My resident was extremely disturbed and I said, don't take him out of the box. But Dr. Gear, it's a box. Don't take him out of the box. It'll be fine. And we just left him in the box till he went to the operating room and he was perfectly happy in his box. Um, hair traction splints are the bane of my existence. Um, I think they should be banned. Um, hopefully not offending any EMTs in the room. I've rarely ever seen one appropriately applied. This is a great picture, I have to orient you guys. So this is, the patient's head's up here. This is his collar that's been taken off and is laying on his abdomen. Um, so that's why it looks so, so, this is all sort of in the heat of the moment, right? Um, so this little blue part, does that arrow show? Yeah, so this, this part belongs under the ischium, all right? This bruise is where his mid-shaft femur fracture is. Correct. Um, so, and this, is, this was a brand new hair traction splint. I was so tempted to put it in the garbage can from whatever hospital it came from. I don't know if you can read these little signs, but right here on this it says, this strap just above the knee. <laughs> and his knee's right here. I mean, this, and then it says, this strap just below the knee, and this strap just above the knee. Well, his knee's up here, so. You could hurt people with these things. I mean, this is pushing right up on the femur fracture. It's angulating the fracture. And I've seen these even if they're appropriately applied. And the, this top sort of hard plastic blue part is underneath the ischium where it belongs. I've actually seen people get a sciatic nerve palsy from this. So I think these are terrible. They don't actually do anything. They give everybody some sort of false sense of security that they're actually doing something to help this. These things, I think, are terrible. You're better off in a box. Put them in the box. Um, Pre-hospital fracture care. Don't be afraid to kind of realign the limb. If there, it looks just completely crazy cattywampus and something is sitting at a 90 degree angle, you're not going to damage anything by sort of gently just sort of putting things where they go. And once again, it hurt. It, it seems like it's going to hurt them, but it hurts them when it's at the 90 degree angle too. So just sort of do a quick little tink. And it's, I know it sounds crazy and scary, but don't be scared. You're not going to damage anything by doing that. And always remember that if somebody has a severe enough injury to create a badly displaced femur fracture, tibia fracture, humerus fracture, they potentially have some other fracture, or some, I'm sorry, some other injury to the internal parts that you can't see that doesn't look near as dramatic as the 90 degree angle halfway down their leg, but it's the internal injury that's going to kill them, not their femur fracture. So don't get fixated on the femur fracture. So briefly, um, summarizing, um, pediatric musculoskeletal injuries are common from various types of toy and non-toy-like devices. Um, consider sending these to a pediatric orthopedic surgeon if you're uncertain as to what to do. Remember that they're not adults and they have some differences in their skeleton and that honestly most pe pediatric fractures will heal no matter what. They might just heal in a bad position, but they will heal. Healing's usually not a problem in kids. Most important factors are patient age, mechanism of injury, and other associated injuries. Good results are possible with a variety of closed or open treatments. There is a trend these days for more invasive treatments and more treatments towards operative fixation. I'm not sure that that's actually a good trend. And um, you just have to learn to use good clinical judgment and good techniques to get good results. Thank you. Questions in 10 minutes. Yes. Um, ADD, what about dirt bike? So, the, so I have to say the question for the other room. So he asked about ATVs and what about dirt bikes. I think those are just as dangerous in some ways more dangerous. I mean, I could have listed a whole host of other things that kids use that injure themselves. I don't think they're any more or less dangerous and they're just a big part of the culture around here. I mean, I have a patient not too long ago who had already had both his arms in casts who was on his dirt bike. <laughs> just like, can't stop them. Yes. 
back in the OR or because sometimes kids come up from the OR and some of them are already uh, split. I mean, how do you decide yeah. which ones need to be split? So the question is about when to make the decision to split the cast, either ER or the OR. I think some of it is just sort of how far out from injury they are, because you usually are maximum swollen sort of 24 to 48 hours out from injury. So a lot of times these kids have been in other hospitals or other clinics, and you're sort of at that time when you're actually operating on them, and you're sort of max swollen. Depending on, I think you're more prone to swelling if you've had to do an open reduction than a closed reduction, how much you have to um, <laughs> manipulate the injury. Um, I have a very low threshold for splitting a cast. I think it's a very easy thing to do and it's much easier to do in the operating room while the kid is still asleep or in the ER while they're still sort of half asleep than at three in the morning when they're screaming in pain and it's this massive drama on the floor. Um, but I think that's just sort of one of those individual th things you have to kind of look at fracture pattern, how much swelling they have when you put the cast on, age of the child. So it's, there's no real clear cut answer to that. Other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Log myself off here. Actually, don't me to leave myself off. I don't care. I mean, I'm logged in. Is that going to mess you up? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't mess you up.